morning. Um, and so today we're going to be talking about shaders, and then and it's more of an introduction to to graphics and shaders. Um, now, some of you have done the 200 level, so um, IMT 2531, the graphics course. Um, for some of you, this is all just repeating stuff you already know because you played with shaders and you played with graphics. But there's a good section of the class who haven't done that course. Um, now, yeah, it used to be that we'd only have people who'd done the graphics course or the AI course who'd come in. We've opened up a little bit. This is the last year that we're running this course as well, so it is kind of a bit more open, a bit more catch-up. Um, actually, one of the discussions is um, that we're having currently in the department is should we continue to run this course? Um, should should you know? And should I continue to teach it from way over here in New Zealand? Um, and is it is it useful and valuable? Are you guys still enjoying it? Um, that sort of thing. So um, it isn't. I mean, it will be um, important for us to kind of understand um, whether you think this is a good elective to continue in Yervik or whether we should kill this as a course at the end of this particular um, semester. So, so yeah, so I, I'll, I'll, we'll be asking for your feedback as well um, in the next few weeks about the course and whether you'd think it should continue. So today we're going to talk about graphics and shaders. Um, okay, so let's, let's wind our minds back <laughs> to actual the original graphics that were done, right? Because shaders are about trying to create colors on a screen, right? Where, yeah, I mean, you can think, what about VR? Well, it's screens that go next to eyes, right? So they're still screens. Uh, so when we look back in graphics, we can we can look at the sort of the 2D motivation. And when we moved from 2D to 3D is when we started doing more interesting calculations about graphics, right? So um, we moved away from directly influencing thing, pixels on screen. So when I started programming, you'd actually change the pixels on screen. Well, actually, you wouldn't change the pixels on screen. You'd change pixels in a piece of memory, and that piece of memory was directly mapped to the screen. All right, so if I change a piece of, of, a piece of memory here to a number, that represented a pixel somewhere on the screen directly memory mapped, All right? Um, and so you didn't do any more calculations. Oh, I want a color there, 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 I want a color there. That's, that's kind of how we did it. Um, however, we started to notice that some of what we were doing had structure. And we'd want a cube. And so we'd want all of the colors filled in. And when we moved the cube, we'd want a whole cube to move all together. And when it went further away, it should get smaller. And when it came closer to me, it should get bigger. So we had these ideas, general ideas around how shapes change when you looked at them as they went further away and smaller and up close and bigger. Or, I suppose I'm doing it for the camera, small here, too big there, right? Um, so this idea of, of distance being related to size, one of the first versions of 3D games was Mode 7. And mode 7 was just fake 3D. What it did is it drew these lines down here. Um, it, it drew lines on the screen. And it had blocks of color. And then it made the blocks color smaller. And that represented um, objects that were further away. And then a block a wee bit smaller, objects further away, block a wee bit smaller, objects further away. And so it kind of got shrunk towards the horizon line. And then when there was an object, say the black line there, intersected with those things it would change their colors in this as you can see the black dots kind of in towards the center right so you'd get this this line coming in right as your perspective went out a straight line a line that was parallel with you say the corner of the road because the mode 7 racing car game when you looked at it from the fake 3d it would look like it was going in even though it was going parallel with you and that's because each time the row of colors expanded and got wider the where that black line crossed would get closer okay so so this was that top down view was turned into this 
front-on view that looked 3D. And then we say, well, we've got lines going that way and lines going that way. So we now need to do some math to work out where the lines intersect. All right? And so as soon as we started doing any kind of fake 3D stuff, we started doing maths about 3D. And that's where kind of the birthplace of 3D graphics and um, shaders come from, is way back in the just how do we make something look kind of like it's smaller when it's further away. So now what we do is we say that this, <clears throat> this would be a viewport, right? So this is what a viewport. The idea that I look through a viewport and the camera is a viewport where if you look at parallel lines from, from here, they appear quite large here, but as they come close to my eyes, they get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and smaller right? So, that, so there's this idea of further from the viewport gets smaller, right? That's because we, we don't have a, um, a orthogonal projection. Right? We have a perspective projection, which scans out. So, um, and that's because we have a lens in the camera. We can talk about that. Okay, so 3D um, world from a 2D, a 3D world into a 2D scene. So, we have these windowing systems. And so the window gives you the area on screen that you're going to draw to. And that is basically your port on the, win the world. Again, when we started, that was the entire screen. And some games will still say, hey, they want the entire screen because that's easier than trying to do things in a window, right? Because you have to add the additional offset of where the window is to make sure you're drawing the pixels in the right places, right? So they're actually visible. Now, on modern operating systems, that's mostly handled by the operating system. So realistically, the developer doesn't actually have to force it into full screen mode. Um, they now do that because it removes some of the unnecessary interface that could get in the way of you clicking on things. So, so they, they go full screen more because they choose that interface rather than the graphics requires them to. Um, and when we look at the putting a, a, a 2D window, um, we're looking at what the, like the offset for the 3D content in that 2D window. Now, um, in most modern operating systems, uh, the, 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 the operating system will handle your window, right? And it will give you a window handle. And that's what you get when you start OpenGL, when you start Visual Studio, when you start um, Unity or Unreal, they will handle basically the standard windowing. Mostly um, Unreal and Unity will go full screen because that's easier than de dealing with windows, but you can start them in windowed mode and your game doesn't really have to know that. Um, it will just have to operate within a different window scale. Your game might have to know if the window scale changes, and that's that can be a challenge. So, from that early, how do we project and get this? Well, we got the very first graphics pipelines. So this is how graphics have been were done initially when we started moving into OpenGL and and, and 3D graphics is that we'd have 3D models. So we'd get a cube that would be a model that would come in and we'd do model transformations into 3D world coordinates that would create. So we'd go from the 3D model coordinates and the 3D world coordinates, which is where is this thing in our conceptual world? And then we'd take it, we'd take the model and we'd find the, the, the camera position and we'd look, what does this model look like from this camera position, right? So that was the, the next part. We would then see what we'd clip, right? So if so, there's a, a bottle of sunscreen behind the camera. In a virtual world, I wouldn't have to render that sunscreen because you wouldn't see it because the camera's pointing towards me, okay? So that would be clipping things outside of this projector window here, right? So there's this cone that comes out from that camera and you only need to worry about the things in that um, well, it's actually a pyramid, but yeah, in this in this area that comes out from the camera, the cone that comes out from the camera, that's the only bits of the world you need to worry about. Um, having calculated the clipping, we'd get the we'd still be in eye coordinates, and we would project the three D model onto a flat surface to make it look right on a two D plane. Right, so the eye looks through the two D plane onto the 3D objects. 
The easiest way to do this, honestly, if, you've, if you're sitting um, near a window, is you take a whiteboard marker uh, and you close one eye, because your eyes are a bit weird, they do binocular things, and that's, that's actually really hard for, well, it's hard to draw stuff. So cover your one eye, one, um, yeah, cover one eye, grab your whiteboard marker, look at the world and draw the world on the window. Right, so just take your window, keep your head the same distance from it, and then just trace the outline of objects. Ta-da! You are doing the um, graphics pipeline 1.1. There you go. Um, we're just automating that process, right? Because that process takes the, the, the tree you can see out your window as a 3D model. It, it like, we, we take that tree, we know where it is in the, in, in the actual scene, right? Because it has local coordinates, and then we put it out in the world. Um, we then try and work it out from where my eye is through a viewing plane, right? We call that the the, project, the plane of projection, the projection plane. Um, and I've drawn on that window what that world looks like through that pane of glass, okay? And that gives me my 2D screen coordinates. Okay, so that was the old school style graphics pipeline. Um, you pass it in small amounts of information about the model and about the view position and it would do all of the calculations okay so it go through each of these stages um, now that's 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 cool and all um, however if we want to do anything more interesting than just trying to physically represent the real the real world in the way that our eyes work in the world if we want to do anything else then we need some flexibility so I'll skip over two, we won't do the whole history thing, but um, in version three, we had pixel data and vertex data. Now vertex data was that original model, that 3D model that came in, has points on it, which we call vertices. Um, those, those corners, we could influence. And we could move them around a little bit, we could project them, when we project them, that's, that's an operation we do. And so we opened up some programming aspects from three and we created display lists and there's evaluators and there's per vertex operations. So they, they opened up this pipeline of how do we get a 3D model to an interesting set of pixels. Uh, and here you see that there's still this idea of pixel data and pixel operations down in the green down here. Um, but we've started to also talk about per fragment operations and the way down the bottom corner here a frame buffer right so um the rasterization you see in the middle here uh where we've got the vertex is coming that is where we turn the triangles from the models into pixels on the screen and basically it just take it calculates the triangle take the top bit steps across to make a line, then steps down one line, hits the edge of the triangle, draws that triangle on screen until it gets the other other line of the triangle, and it just keeps doing that process and turns a, a dis triangular description into a set of pixels. Okay, so that's what the pipeline was doing. We then moved to 4.1, and they had this model of the pipeline, and now we've fully moved into what the, 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 the frame buffer has fragment shaders that come into it there are things that pull the vertices vertex pulls um, we have vertex shaders which change the positions of the points on the models the explicit surface description is called a mesh that mesh has vertices the vertex shader affects those positions right um, tessellation is interesting because it used to be that everything had to be triangles, but now with tessellation, we turn things that might not be triangles into triangles, so that we have now a, a, a perfectly triangular, triangular mesh um, object coming through. And then we have geometry shaders, which are actually working on those triangles post tessellation. All right, so. Before we had vertex shaders, which were explicit vertices of the model. But if I divide a, a vertex surface that's a quad rather than triangle, right? So rather than a triangle with three points, right? 
I just write a quad with four points, um, the tessellator turns that into two triangles. Right? So, but I can still affect, though, I can do vertex shaders on the vertices, the description of the model, and then when I tessellate it, the tessellated version is, how, um, is dealt with by the geometry shader. And then we have a, a transformation um, feedback system where we can bring information back to the, the model. So we can reset things, we can adjust things, we can update things. And then we can turn it into a fragment um, shader and that goes into a frame buffer. Now the frame buffer, if you're, multi, um, if you're using double buffering, the frame buffer holds an image and when I want to up, and when I want to update, I show you this one. And in the background, I'm editing this frame. And as soon as I finish putting stuff on this frame, I will swap it in. And then I'll use this frame and I'll edit this frame until it's fixed. And then I'll swap it in. So as far as you can see, you just see the instantaneous swap, rather than me slowly updating the the content of that buffer. And so that's what one of the reasons for this frame buffer. You also these there are texture buffer objects. The textures are, are in texture buffer objects, which are arrays of colors which are used to to show to to access so that when you want to paint a color on a model, you have the the background color, the sort of the innate color of that object. It's affected by the lighting and it's affected by how much light there is, right? Because if I'm in a completely black room. My t-shirt's no longer grey, it's black, because I'm in a completely black room. If I was in a completely red room, my t-shirt would be a light red colour, because you wouldn't really see the grey, you'd just see the red from the lighting. Okay, so we we have to understand the base colour of something and the lighting colour to generate the, um, the actual colour on screen, and the textures are held in those texture buffer objects. Okay, so this is, that's how 4.1 looked. Um, we're now up to 4.6, uh, and here in 4.6, you can start, we're seeing, like now, they're talking about sort of modules that stick and feed into a main pipeline, and we've now added compute shaders and frame buffers as the end points for a whole bunch of calculations. Now, to fully understand and manage your entire graphics pipeline. You have to manage all of these things, right? It used to be, when I when I started playing with OpenGL in the early ones and twos, um, I could just feed it some um, um, some objects and it would draw them on screen, it's great, right? But now because we've given you so much flexibility about how you draw things on screen, we're now at a point where we, we, we have to say and program more because we've been given more flexibility. Now, at the same time, game engines like Unity and Unreal have come along, and now most people don't have to write that detail, except the people who are working on the shader bits of those game engines. Now, what Unity and Unreal do is it takes some of these areas, it, it automates almost all of this, but gives you a little bit of access to some vertex shaders and some fragment shaders, and some geometry shaders. So it, the game engine is doing all of these and then opens up some APIs so that you can do individual parts of this bigger, larger framework. Okay, so, right, so let's, let's talk some terms. Um, so actually, we'll just check where we're 20 minutes in. Oh yeah, we've got a good number of students. Excellent, thank you guys, I'm, I'm glad you've turned up. Um, so, some terms. Vertex data. So, vertex data is um, the the surface model. Um, when you when you see a, a a triangulated model, it's got all those little triangles. That's the vertex data. It's usually re referred to as a mesh uh, in game engines. There is a display list. When you're working with OpenGL, it's all of the things that are going to be displayed in a single operation. Uh, and that's quite a low level concept. Evaluators, first, force all data to be vertex based. So it goes through and these evaluators um, that you see um, in here in this, this, this tessellation phase is an evaluator. 
and it forces things into into being triangle based and vertex based and converts splines to vertex data right so that's what the tessellator does um, there's per vertex information which is information you add on each of those little pieces of of, of the the mesh have data like which bones they're connected to if you're doing animation the normal to the to the 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 vertex so it knows which which direction to look at um, and rasterization as I said before is when you turn vertices into a set of pixels um, oh and I, I yes seeing we're 20 minutes in I just thought I'd I, I if if you haven't seen the news this morning which I assume you probably have um, Donald Trump and his wife have both tested positive for COVID-19 um, so that's going to have an influence, interesting influence on the 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 world and the American election certainly, um, with the president being positive. So um, ha, and I get a <laughs> a bot asking me to try and get big followers. Okay, so so we keep going with terms. So I just thought you know, I'm assuming you guys have heard of. Um, wow, we've got a bunch of the bots coming in. Um, I assume you guys have heard that that Donald Trump has coronavirus. Um, it's just a, a you know relevant, interesting piece of news that just came out earlier today. So, other terms: pixel data, individual pixels on screen, uh, and those are textures and colors. We talk about pixels. Um, we have pixel operations, things that you do on pixels. Um, texture assemblies and texture buffer objects. These are where we we organize the textures that we're going to use. Anyone else having audio issues? Okay. Oh, okay. So some of you are having audio issues, not everybody. Okay. Um, sorry about the audio issues. I'm not sure how. I, I am saving recording the session, so I'll put that up in the YouTube channel so that you guys can come back to it and see it there. So if you're missing some of it, I'll get that sorted. Um, Okay, so you refresh the audio. That's that helped. So, and and the last one of these frame buffers. Now, frame buffers is really interesting because um, one of the things that that was a problem was oh, where's the YouTube link? It's it's actually it's uh, in the course. If you go to the course overview and I put it under lectures and then it's the YouTube playlist right, so it's in the playlist under the uh, which I've been putting them up there uh, and I will have to add the other one that I didn't put in there yep so cool that'll help you get there um, okay so one of the interesting things is when when I when, when we were first doing graphics we'd put the frames up and we'd have a frame where we do write stuff and then we'd have the frame we're showing you and then we'd flop flip them right which is why you get like the frame number because it's which in that frame buffer we'd swap them and each time we did a swap we'd count right so this would be five this would be six would be me updated until we're done and then we'd swap in six and then we'd edit this one to be seven and once it was done we'd fix it and then we'd swap it in okay so so we had these these frames that were being displayed on screen um one of the interesting concepts to get into your head is that those frames don't have to go to screen so you can actually do partial calculations off screen into frame buffers right so you just think of them as as areas that hold images generated by the computer now one of the classic things to do with those frames is to do you could do some visibility checks for example where you could run the the game with the textures removed but only the like you'd have pink for enemies and gray for everything else and if you rendered that if there was any pink in your image you could see the enemy all right so but you wouldn't render, render that to screen you, you could render it off screen then cal do calculations on it and then either dump it or you could pick out that pink and then highlight it in the game which would be a cheat that you would see some people use right is that highlight like supervision highlight the enemy to make it easier to see them 
Okay, so, so you can use some of those frame buffers to render things in different ways and then use that information. Um, often it's also used to render things from a different perspective. If you want to generate a mirror, for example, right, rather than doing ray tracing off the mirror, you put a camera behind the mirror looking out at the world, render the world from that camera's um, um, perspective, save it in a frame buffer, and then use that frame buffer as the texture for the mirror. Right, so, you, so, so what's actually happening is that you don't see the mirror, what you see is you have a second render pass with a camera behind where the mirror would be looking out at the world. And you just make sure that when the, when the player's eyes hit the, the mirror, the camera is looking out at that normal, looking out at the reflected angle from that mirror, and that's where the can, camera is looking out through. Right, So, you know, you can produce a mirror not by having to do complex mathematics, just by putting another camera in and doing another render pass. Okay, so representing information for graphics. Well, um, when we had sprites, which were completely flat, right? These were 2D images, no actual vertices, just a flat, drawn, hand-drawn image. The game Pac-Man, the games from, from the 80s and 90s, uh, we're all sprites, right? Um, all game sprites. It is an explicit representation, so it represents every um, um, pixel. Um, and then, so that's, that's, that's flat, very flat. We then move into surface representations that are explicit, where we represent every point on the surface of an object, okay? And that is a, a an explicit surface mesh that we are creating. There are, and these advances are coming along, um, implicit representations, which are mathematical representations of the concepts of three-dimensional objects. So one of the concepts of a three-dimensional object is a sphere, which has a center point and a surface that can be described as distance from that center point, okay? So that would be a, a point plus a radius describes the surface of a mathematically perfect sphere. Now this is not the, a, a, a triangle representation, right? It's not a mesh, it's a mathematically provable object, right? It's a mathematical formula. In our OpenGL model, when we get to tessellation, right? So the third step down here, which is tessellation, that's where a mathematical model of a, a sphere would be converted into triangles so that the rest of the engine, the rest of the, the um, graphics card, can process just triangles. Right? So it doesn't have to worry about the maths anymore because it's turned that maths into triangles with its tessellation. Of course, you have cylinders and planes, and you can have coarse curves that get translated into triangles later as well. So, triangles. I've talked a lot about triangles. Um, triangles are fantastic. Um, they, they're, they're mathematically beautiful, um, and they're simple, and they've got a lot of his history behind them. Um, they, you can actually take three-dimensional points, okay? so 3D points, X, Y, Z, and a, a point is just a single point in space, so it doesn't represent anything. You can't see it because it's got no area. So it's a single point in space. A line, right, two points generate a line, still infinitely small, so you can't see anything because there's no there's no width in that line. So there's nothing there. So if you were actually throwing things at it, you wouldn't ever hit it because it's infinitely thin. However, once you add a third point, one, two, three, we define a triangle. Well, actually, I suppose one, two, three like that. I could do one point here, one point there, one point there. So one, two, three points. That then describes an area. That area now is something that if we fire a, if we fire a light at it, if we look for it on screen, we'll be able to see it because it has a surface area. And that is a face, right? So that's the face, it's part of a mesh. It is defined by three um, points in three-dimensional space. They're easy, they're fast, the tools have been set up to deal with meshes. All of the stuff we deal with currently are 
uh, all of the pipelines for the graphics are mesh pipelines. That's not true uh, in the next wave of engines. So Unreal 5 appears to be making use of the ray tracing engines in the 3080s and 3070s, actually in the 2000 series as well, right? So if you've got a 2070 or a 2080, uh, you'll have a ray tracing engine as part of your graphic card. Um, and in the 3000 series, in the 3070s, 3080s, um, they also have ray tracers built in. And it appears that Unreal 5 is making a play in redefining how it deals with this pipeline. Okay, so although, you know, this is the last year I teach this course, triangles are still the main way that people construct models. That might change in the next three to five years. Okay, so we, we might move from this surface mesh to actually defining objects more. Right? There's going to be a massive change if, if that happens. So, um, so triangles are the current way things do. It's really easy to project a triangle because of the three points. You just project it onto the screen and it's very easy to see the triangle. Okay, so it's got, that's, that's why we do triangles. All of these. Now, if you remember back when I gave the lecture on game engine architecture, I talk about scene graphs. Well, this is where, when we talk about graphics, that's where scene graphs matter, right? So um, when we place an object in the world, we have to work out its relationship to other objects. And so we have, a, if we have cubes have a local um, orientation, so they have 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and that would be one triangle. And then we have 1, 0, 0, um, one zero one and one one zero would be another triangle. So these we, we could define a cube by um, the twelve triangles of the six faces. Right, so six faces of cube, tri twelve triangles, and then we'd have an offset in x, y, and z space of all of the triangles, and we could just offset them, and they'd be triangles in three dimensional space. Now, when you move them, you want to move them all together. You don't want to have some of your triangles move and leave some of the triangles behind. That would be ridiculous. And so that's where we have this hierarchy of having a root node, and it has its transformation, and then all of the other nodes, all of the other vertices, are just relative to the root. So to do that with that cube definition, the cube would still keep its um, local um, scale and its its local coordinate system but we would have a transformation in a scene graph to say right move this cube over to the far side of the world right so local coordinate system is still there but it's now globally got a transformation that takes it away into the distance so for example if we had a look at the car here instead of just being a cube and having triangles it's now a car that has a car body and four tires. Those four tires may come from a car body mesh, and each tire may use the same model for a tire. It's just used those in four different locations. Right? And so each of those have a transformation and rotation associated with them. So that moves them to the right part of the car. Okay, so that's what the scene graph deals with. We also so that so the scene graph talks about where things are and how they relate. The camera is how we turn that scene graph into something that's going to be seen by a camera and then put onto a 2D plane. Just like I suggested you before, you close one eye and draw, draw on your window, wipe it off. Um, that is that is the, the role of the camera, is to work out where that camera position is and define that camera position. Now, it's really nice to have a camera position where you have an up vector, because there's a lot of calculations that are to do with the angles between the up vector and the world and uh, projections onto the screen which use the up vector of the the camera to know what they look like um and so you know that's that's really really useful the problem is with this camera for example um i i currently have an up vector there right and if i take this camera and i pan it left and i pan it right that's all good, that looks fine, right? And I can yaw up and yaw down, and I can roll, that's all good. 
and I, if I um, uh, if I um, so if I pan up, pan up, and I pan up, and I go through this this through 180, and pan and pan and pan and pan up. Oh oh, wait a minute. Oh dear, um, you're upside down. Now when I my yaw myself round and look back at me, I'm now upside down. So my up vector has changed. And I'd have to do a roll to fix my my yaw and my pan. That's that's really, really bad. Okay? So so the so the problem is that when I go through that center up here, we hit what's called gimbal, right? So what's happening is it goes up and what you sometimes have to do is go like that and then come down so it's still upright. All right? So when it comes up and looks at me, it's still fine. Um, doing all of that calculation is massively difficult. It causes problems, how you resolve it, how you deal with that. You need to move into using quaternions for your camera, so that as you move in three-dimensional space, you don't lose your coordinate system, because if you use standard um, Euler um, coordinates, it's going to break. Okay, And so that gets us into matrix multiplication. So if you want to understand deeply what's going on, you have to understand matrix, right? Matrices and matrix multiplication. So there's a bunch of maths in here. I, I do not teach maths in lectures, right? Maths in lectures seems an odd thing to do. What I, what you, how you learn maths is you do it in code with interactions, right? So you have to learn it yourself. So I'm, I'm only going to introduce you to this so that you can see some of these things like cosines, which you hopefully have seen before, that in computer graphics, finally, finally, there's a reason why your high school teacher made you suffer through understanding sines and cosines. Never thought it was going to be useful. This is the only place that you actually use it as an adult. Okay, well, it's not the only one, but it's one of the few. So. Sines and cosines actually help you do rotations and shearing and scaling things, right? So, so we actually have in like two x and y, we can have a two by two matrix which we multiply it by, and we can do things like rotate the object, we can shear it, we can bend it, and we can scale it up and down. But with only multiplying the x and y we currently have. We can't actually move it because we're we're always doing a multiplication of x and y. We're not able to shift it off somewhere else. So what actually happens is we do we have a three by three matrix and we add a one to the bottom, right? Um, to make it instead of two to make it a three dimensional. And then actually technically what we do is to transform and move an object. We take parts of x and parts of y and we add those in according to the the distance we're going to move along this other vector and so that that the transformation x and y get added to x and y and that tx and ty down the bottom here because they're in the x row they get added to x and the y row they get added to y and the one it just stays where it is right so now technically interestingly mathematically what we're doing to move things in two dimensions, we actually represent them in three dimensions and we then just shear that. We twist the three dimensional world to move things in the two dimensional world. Seems a bit odd, but that's that's actually the sort of mathematics behind what goes on here. Um, and you'll see that happen in other places. We'll move to four dimensional vectors, four dimensional matrices to deal with three dimensional translations and, and, and rotations and things, right? So. So don't be surprised when some of the things you think are three-dimensional will end up being four by four matrices, which appear to be four-dimensional. But that's because they're moving into this, the higher dimensional space so they can move things around rather than just affect them where they currently are. Okay, so one of the standard transformations, and you can see this here is the X, Y, Z now in, in three dimensions plus W, that ability to do something and translate things in three dimensions well here what we're doing is we're using the z value 
<laughs> yep, so what we're doing here is we're using the Z value um, to project a point onto that camera space, right? Because if you imagine that your screen here is X and Y, right? So we've got X and Y and Z into the screen, right? So Z's in. To make it all land up at the same point, uh, if I divide by the Z, if I say you're 100 meters away and then I divide by 100 meters, that gets you to here. Now, interestingly, I can actually use the, the similar triangles, which again, you hopefully learned at school, and say, well, the similar triangles say that a thing at Y1 that's Z1 away is the same size as a thing at Y2 that's Z2 away. And so that by dividing by that Z, I'm able to bring them all down and, and I divide the Y's and the X's by that Z depth. And that then that, that makes them all appear to be on a screen rather than actually a, a, a long way away. And it takes all of those values, turns them from X, Y, Z into just X, Y values, okay? Yes, that is the, the NTNU logo in the corner. Um, it's an NTNU lecture, because I'm, I'm lecturing to from New Zealand to Norway. Um, and I've been going for about 40 minutes now. Okay, so that's basic perspective projection. Now, if you want to learn this, you will have to go away and do it yourself. I'm just trying to give you the concept here to understand what's going on. Okay, so... Um, now, that gives us the idea that we're turning pixels, these vertices, right? And we're multiplying x, y, z vertices, we multiply them by numbers, we end up with a, a bunch of positions on a 2D screen that used to be 3D. That's great for Y diagrams, but how do we, do, like, what, what we care about is what things actually look like, and that's the colours. Okay, so, um, you should go and have a look at the um, Learn OpenGL dot com lighting basics um which are really useful um uh, by the way i wasn't able to find the lectures you can can you give us a link in the chat yeah i can i can give you a link in the chat um it's that link though i think that is currently unlisted so yeah um i'm listing it now that's right um so that's the link in the tip chat for the previous lectures in the series. I don't think I got last week's up, but they're in my previous Twitch history because I've got a couple of weeks Twitch history. I'll put up last week's lectures now they've got good internet. Okay, so now that we know we're, we're taking vertices and we're putting them on screen, we also now have to work out the color of things. Ah, that's why you couldn't find them because they were unlisted unless you had the link. Um, so, um, this is OpenGL, um, uh, learn OpenGL, and so this is one of the standards way we do graphics. Now, to find out the color or to like to construct the color of a virtual object, is you take ambient, which <laughs> ambient is a bit weird because in the real world, ambient just means that there is some light always around, and without a moon or stars or some light in the background, there would be zero ambient light, right? Um, now, so in reality, there is only diffuse light. It's just diffuse light that's been bounced around so much that we don't know what direction it's coming from anymore. So we kind of cheat and just say, well, let's just say there's some light illuminating everything a little bit, right? And that's ambient light. So that allows you to have a small amount of color that every object has, whether or not there's any lights in the scene. Once you have lights in the scene, you then get, you can then add diffuse and specular lighting. Diffuse lighting and specular lighting talk about the relationship between the triangle surfaces and the lights that come in. So, ambient is everywhere. The diffuse, you can imagine, is there's a light source, the light's coming in, and I'm just looking to see how oriented my um, surface is with that light. Right? So, for example, on my face, you can see that there is a, a, a surface here that is being lit by a, an, or, an orangey light up there. Right? So there's an orange light up there. You can see when I cover it up. Um, when I do that, 
this is now directly lit, this area of my head is lit from that light. Some of my face is being lit from the blue light from the screen, right? And so you can see that's, that's coming in this way. Now, as I, as I turn my face and look up there, more of my face is now facing at the light, and so I get more of the diffuse light from it, right? Because it's, it's to do with the angle between the surface, right? And luckily this bit of my, my head is reasonably pointing at that light. Do a wee bit more, I can wee bit brighter. Um, specular is where you get that wee highlight on my, my, my forehead here, which is just where you get that mirror reflection, right? So you get it more when you, when you hold up a glass and you can see that line down there, that's a specular reflection off the, the screen here, right? It's where the screen is doing a perfect reflection and getting onto the edge of that light, that, that glass, okay? So these are two things, again, mathematical calculations to do with the normal, right? Which is a vector that is 90 degrees to the surface of the, um, um, of the system, right, of the, the triangle, the surface of the triangle, um, whereas diffuse, diffuse uses the normal and says how, how close are you pointing to the light source. Specular says, oh, when I look in at something, have I got the mirror angle, right? So that's that R, reflected angle, is how close am I looking at to it being perfectly reflected, okay? Now, we do those calculations. That's how we generate these two different diffuse lights coming from a direction specular when i look at it it bounces correctly i combine those two things and i get this combined phong version of specular um this is a faked reflection it is just kind of working out those angles um and they so highly reflective surfaces where they have a lot of specular very plastic diffuse surfaces have no specular so this is why some of the early graphics, well, some of the early graphic stuff looked like rubber or plastic, or rubber more, because they were just using diffuse because specular cost too much to do computationally. Okay, so um, now, when you're doing these sort of things, you've got to understand a bit more math. And so I thought I'd just, just do interpolation because that's part of what we're doing is we're actually interpolating between points and we then have to work out how we smooth those out. So, I, if, we, if you understand linear interpolation, um, this sounds really, really simple, but it has quite a lot of math with it. Um, I put a long version of math there, not to scare you, but just to say, look, yes, I know there's math, you can do the math. Luckily, with Unreal and Unity, you generally don't have to do this level of math, but it's useful to understand how the math works because most of the graphics requires quite a bit of math to get the effect you you want at the speed you want it so a linear interpolation between two points often used when we're doing this rasterization this is how we go and look up textures we do these sort of things we're looking at these linear interpolations so uh if and so in this equation we have um f2 so if you look at we graph up the and just just there that we graph um you look at 0.2 and that's at about 0.9 right so f of 3 is 0 0.015 okay so that's that line that comes down that third line on the so one two three this line is has these two points if i'm a, th a third away along 2.3 i'm expecting it to be about 0.6 right because 2.3 it's kind of on this side of that line, so it's going to be in here somewhere. And so what I do is I actually work out the contribution from this red point, the contribution from that red point, and that's what I do here in that, um, I, I, I describe it in the first y equals, saying, oh, it's a relationship between the x position of point A and the y position, and, 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 yeah, so, so the y is the x position of a and the x position of a, and I use one minus to work out how far along I am, and then I do it the function of, and I multiply that by the function of the two. So if I actually take that off 2.3, which is the point I wanted to find out at this one, is 0.3 away, so I do one minus 0.3 of the nine, right? So it's, it's, it's mostly the nine, because it's got six 
uh, two thirds of the nines value, and it has one third of this 0.15. And so that's where we work out 0.67, which is actually just up here, because that's the relative contribution of each side. That's in a straight linear interpolation. Now that's very simple maths, but when you draw the general formula, it looks really, really complex math. It's not very complex, it's just doing that interpolation. Of course, that gives you very jerky interpolation. What you actually want is a smooth interpolation so that you would have a smooth movement between those points. You can do full polynomials, which would give you that crazy equation. You don't want to have to work out that crazy equation. That's far too much work. Certainly don't do it by hand. You only get that through the computer working out a factor six polynomial. So we actually often do halfway between these two and we use these points to define a smooth surface, which we call a spline. Now, how we do that is we say, well, actually, to work out where this point is, right, on that way down, I don't actually really need to know much about zero, and I don't really need to know anything about five or six, right, because they're kind of too far away. I only really care about two and three, the ones on either side of where I'm looking, and the one before that, and the one after that. So I have a, so what I do is I generate a polynomial degree four, a spline, through just my two nearest neighbors and their neighbors. So I get that curve. And as I move to calculate a point on this first part, I'm using one, two, and three. In between here, I'm using one, two, three, and four, and, well, zero, one, two, and three. As I move past into this section, I'm now using one, two, three, and four, and as I come through and pass three, I would then use two, three, four, and five, right? So, so each time I move, I just get those four neighbors, and I calculate a smooth curve just for those four neighbors and ignore everyone else, right? And that's how we create uh, uh, an order for smooth spline, I can then use those as control points. I move those up and down, the, the curve changes. And then when I send it to the tessellation engine, it takes that smooth curve and turns it all into tiny wee triangles, right? Which it can then render, okay? So, so as I said, very simple maths. You then make it smooth and you have to find polynomials and there are algorithms to do that. You can actually use the, the libraries to do that. And then this gives you a spline. Splines can be nicer to build nice, smooth um, easing in and out, for example, is used to splines. And then that moves into to the complex graphics. Now, the last thing I was going to talk about, well, not quite the last thing, I've got a couple more things, but occlusion is an important part of, of rendering. And so here you see um, my attempt to show um, occlusion rendering in PowerPoint, right? Well, actually in Google Slides. So let's, let's watch this. So we're in position A here, okay? So at position A, and I'm looking out into the world. So I'm looking at all of these quads out in the world from a first person's perspective on A. So what I do, the first one I see is the background, and then I see the walls, and then I see this gray one, this purple, this purple, this cyan, the maroon, then the brown, and then there's dark brown and then the green. Now, if I draw all of those, it's called overdrawing, and it takes quite a lot of time because I have to draw from the back of the room and I draw each of those things, I project them onto the screen and draw them all from the back and overwrite them. Now what culling does, right? right so it, or occlusion culling, right? Is it says, hey, I see there's a massive big green object in my way and I won't be able to see any of the cyan or the green or the the, the um, gray block back here because there's this big thing right in my vision. Okay, so that would be occlusion culling where it says, "Oh, this is occluded. I don't need to draw it." Okay, so this is also happening in your engine. So here we see an example of frostrum culling where I I, I cull things outside of my field of view, and this is occlusion culling. Now, if you look at the difference here. Frostroom, you can see it's got all of the things being drawn. But here, there's this whole group that's not being drawn because I've got this large building in my way. 
Okay, so you can see the difference between those two, where when I do occlusion culling, it, that large building gets rid of quite a lot of the scenery at the background because that building's in my way. Okay, so that's the difference between, between frost from culling, where I just say, hey, what's outside of the range of the camera, and occlusion culling, where I say, well, I've put my hand up here, you can't see, see me, so I don't need to render me if I put my hand in the way. So, this all draws us back to this pipeline. Where are we in this pipeline? Well, uh, we've talked about some of the vertices coming in. Uh, the, the vertex shaders are things that move those vertices around. Tessellations, we talked about those smooth curves and how they get turned into triangles. And if you define things mathematically as a sphere rather than triangles, the tessellation engine does that. We then move into the geometry shader, which can take all those wee tiny triangles and move them around. Rasterization takes triangles, turns them into pixels on screen, and the fragment shaders can play with those pixels. Okay, so once you've got the pixels on screen, you then have a fragment shader which can, you know, color them all or move them left or right or blur them by adding them to their neighbor. So, but those are only things that can be done on pixels in the fragment shader, right? So you've got to think, okay, this is, I don't have any data about the model anymore, I'm just looking at pixels that I can see. Okay, so that's that's the main pipeline. Now, of course, this is just an introduction where you actually learn is by doing this stuff. Um, a great site for learning or for playing with shaders programming is Shader Toy. Um, and you can see my face went blank because I lost the white of the screen. So Shader Toy um, has people giving, like, developing shaders and showing off cool shaders, right? So there are lots of interesting shaders they have shader of the week um and so you can see um and you can go in and have a look when you click on one of these it will take you in and it will show you the shader code okay um so that's not too long and also shows you the channel of the data that was coming in so this this data is probably um you can see the kinds of nodes it can grab a whole bunch of different nodes um if i configure it it's linear clamped um i believe that data oh oh, oh i'll reload that reload i just turned off i just deleted that data i didn't intend to do that so this data um will contain these triangles right and these objects and here we do um this takes you through the shader and the colors that are being set and the uvs that are being set right now these these are the most recent shaders done what i recommend is you don't try and look at the these as recent shaders um that looks like it's doing a diff it's yeah, right it's doing a a, a um a, a lighting thing you go okay let's go to browse and i've got 3,637 pages of shaders. So let's go and have a look at some of the very early ones that were done, rather than some of the ones that people have done recently, because they're often better programmers recently. Let's go and look at some of the very earliest ones that were done and go, ah, oh, okay, some of these seem pretty simple. Um, let's have a look at, um, oh, I can see that, that, that one does, that one's pretty complex. That has some lighting in it, that has some bloom, that seems to be weird movement round, that has got some rotations and scalings, that seems to have a glitch coming down it, that's probably a pixel shader. Um, so if I click on that one, it has that much code. Right? It takes this channel, which is a, an image. Oh, I'm sorting on hot, right. Okay, not sorting on date. Thank you, thank you for the note. Uh, if I sort on the newest, that'll give me a much better, so that's the absolute newest, and if I go to the far end of newest, thank you for noting that, I get the very earliest ones, right? Rather than the terrible ones, I get the, some of the very earliest ones that did, and so some of these, like this one, which is how do I make it look like I'm going down a tunnel? Um, this is a very simple shader. Okay, so if you, good spotting, thank you. So if you change it to sort by newest and then go to the oldest, you get to see some of the simplest shaders 
um, and you can see the, the two textures that came in and you can see where they're being used, texture one and texture two. So this is channel, channel one and channel zero. Um, and you can see that it's generating a color by mixing things and you'll see here um, it uses, you know, a bunch of maths, as I was saying, it's multiplication. And you're getting this UV, which is a texture lookup. You're generating color by mixing channels. It doesn't have any of the specular highlights or ambient stuff going on here. If you see something that does have those, so if we go back and we're again newest and the oldest ones, we look for something that has some, that seems to just be mixing videos. <laughs> that seems to be a shade of mix of two videos. He's probably got two video sources. Yes. A video source and this video source right so it's got two video sources and it's using the green screen in the shader to if then else mix them together right to describe the foreground and background color okay so that's that's a a very simple um shader that that merges something with a green screen green um if we go to something slightly less old Right, you'll see this sort of thing, say, oh, that looks pretty, what's that doing? Look in there, and here you'll see, ah, as I said, a matrix, this is a three, um, uh, three matrix in here immediately, and if we look down here, there'll be a, um, the, there'll be the apple color, and let's see, we've got some smooth steps, uh, of B will be specular, so we're color and specular highlighting, and we're generating color, and there you see the normals and the, the floats being calculated. Okay, so, so that's where we get all of these kind of combinations of things being done. And as you see, we've got like the intersect, we've got soft shadow being generated, and it shows you where to do that. This is where it calculates normal, and then it has the main image. So this actually generates the entire apple and everything. It has no input color. It, man it generates all of this mathematically. Okay, so that's quite an impressive a lot it doesn't have a model of an apple it is a mathematical definition with a random texture to generate this look and so yeah there's a lot lot going on here but certainly someone in 2013 had some fun right but yeah so you can go in and you can kind of see how certain devices certain effects were created um, and kind of play with those right so that gives you a, a large number of examples to look at and if we go back here um, as I said, you can go and look at some older examples. Um, this one is a very simple one, which just has uh, a ripple effect and is a fragment shader, right? So it's a fragment shader and it ripples the fragments of this channel zero texture, right? So it just has a, a simple sine wave that ripples that texture down. An example of a fragment shader, okay? Um, now, I, I will be finishing up shortly because I don't want to run too late. Um, so there are some really good tutorials. Uh, so this is a, um, I, so one of the things that I like is, is actually um, to, to think about shaders about doing things other than just trying to make it look realistic because that's kind of what the normal shader is trying to do. So uh, if you want to have a look at the, the OpenGL, uh, the Unity docs, um, it's got the documentation there on writing shaders that shows you the base and introduces you to, to um, vertex fragments, vertex and fragment shaders and what they call surface shaders, which actually also link to lights. Um, and here is a nice example of doing this style of toon shading, right? So it takes you through, uh, again, it will talk about, and you'll see here, again, these, these, this angle of the surface to a light source, and it talks about normals and shows you the dot products, and takes you through generating the normal and the dot product to give you that diffuse lighting. And then it, it actually starts doing weird things like saying, oh, instead of having a smooth diffuse lighting, how about we have a harsh two-tone and we just make it go black or the color. And that's where you get this hard line. And so it takes you through how you write a shader to do things other than normal graphics, okay? So that's where we start to be interesting shaders. And again, we've got the smooth in and out rather than a linear in and out, so it tries to show you how to use that to get some of the smoother effects on here. 
and we now have a specular highlight uh, on this and it says well you can take that specular highlight and make it a dot rather than having it this kind of shiny spot we make it more of a cartoon dot by thresholding it right um, and then they do rim lighting where you try and light the the the, the side again threshold that and that gives you a line around the outside right and sometimes you can change that line to make it look different so that you get different effects in your tune shading right so so you can, so that tutorial will take you through all of that so if you're interested in playing with shading then that's quite a good tutorial to go through with unity uh, it will teach take you through shade the shader lab system which is what um, unity uses as its framework for generating shaders there are two types well multiple types of shaders in unity but the surface shaders interact with lights and the vertex and fragment shaders don't so if you if you want to do only a couple of things on the surface of an individual object you use surface shaders in unity if you want to do more of those things like make the whole image ripple or make the the objects bend and move the actual object itself kind of surface ripple and do things then that's when you move into your vertex and fragment shaders Okay, so that was my very brief introduction to some of the graphics and some of the pipeline and some of how we end up doing um, writing shaders and some example tutorials for you to go now go away and play with shaders because you only get better by actually giving it a go. All right, listening to me isn't going to make you better. Listening to me just gives you an idea of kind of the what, what's going on. And then if you go away and do those tutorials and you play with shaders and you come back and when you've got a problem with them, you ask me on the Discord, I can give you feedback. We can try and, if, you, if you're playing with shaders, we can get those better. Okay, so do you have any questions? Seeing I've been, I, 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 I tried to answer, um, oh yeah, so sorry, I didn't see the one that, that, that was what subject this is, but thank you. Um, Rotcop73. Uh, it is game development. Um, I'm teaching the third year game programmers in Norway from here in New Zealand um, during COVID. So that's all good. Um, and um, yeah, so do you guys have any questions specifically about any of the stuff I said here? A link to the lecture slides. So um, these lecture slides. Um, will be um, put up here um, on the so we actually use um, our GitLab as our repository instead of using blackboard or learning management system i'll put it there i'll upload the slides to to the GitLab because that's what the students are using for for this course um, but i assume that uh, programming mouse might not actually be in the course um, so there is a limit to how much I'm supposed to just give away for free. Um, uh, we can probably find a way of, of getting those slides out and, and making them more available. Okay, any other questions? There are some pretty neat shaders in here. And if you do look at the most recent popular ones that water shader there's actually there there are some some really beautiful effects you can do some cloud effects are really awesome um and yeah so the water is actually being done in, in the shader it's not uh, a water texture that's been developed um from from the surface uh, water it's actually being generated by the shader uh, in real time so which is pretty cool but that's that's a nice general lighting with nice soft shadows so you look here and say well these look like they're all the same objects why is this interesting what's the interesting thing about this is the beautiful soft shadows that all of these have and the interacting soft shadows that they have now that just looks you know it looks like a well lit scene but oh there's a lot of work in there right so you can go and have a look at that shader and see all ah, right i can see what it's doing there to generate all of those now this is actually yeah, all of all of uh, this is where it actually generates all those shapes that's not something you'd add it's this code up here that it talks about how to generate um soft objects um, but that generates all of the all of those shapes aren't coming in from 
from the channel they're not coming in as a data source with with objects they're actually being generated by the shader itself okay with nice shot and it's yeah good looking soft shadows a fun toy to go and have a look at and play with and see what kind of stuff's out there okay with that uh, i will say goodbye to my stream uh, and I'll be on Discord for you guys to chat with me about your projects and if you've got any uh, any other questions. <laughs> when is the next lecture? So, uh, actually, it's uh, now it is so actually for the Norwegians as well. Uh, we've moved to daylight saving, so it is now quarter past twelve here, um, where it's so the the night has been shifting later for me, uh, and you guys are about to move your, your 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 time as well. So I thought for next week, I'm um, instead of going from 12 till 1 32 o'clock on a friday i'm gonna to have to move it earlier to 10 till 12 because that makes it 10 till 12 for me still right 10 to 12 on a friday night okay because we're now gonna be exactly 12 hours apart within a couple of weeks right so so 10 till 12 next week norwegian time um which will be yeah um yeah a bit late but that, that'll be fine right so it'll be 9 till 11 for me this time and then 10 till 12 from from a couple of weeks okay so that's so we're gonna i'll send an email saying that next time um you can follow my twitch channel i i also give lectures to my students in new zealand uh in person in labs uh and i'll potentially stream some other stuff i'm doing as well particularly around vr editing in, in unreal because there's some fun stuff to do in the vr mode and the multi-user mode in in unreal it's quite fun um so yeah but um i'll just be on occasion okay so i'll be over to discord i'll talk to the students in the course about their projects okay have a great night guys um well great afternoon and i'll see you on discord okay bye Oh, well, before I go, I have a question about movement of 3D characters in the game. Having the legs and arms moving with the body in an elegant way. Ooh. Okay. So, that's to do with animation rigging. Um, and so, when you're moving a 3D character in a game, you have a surface definition of the, 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 like the surface definition of the mesh. And what we do is we attach that to what we call bones. Now we, we put a theoretical bone down the center of my mesh and we attach each surface object of the mesh to a bone in the center, okay? So that's, um, and then the skeleton, those bones, we all move together. And so that's how you get the legs and the arms moving with the body in an elegant way is using that skeleton. And then you use, um, Programs, Maya, Maya did some stuff, but the Maya character stuff, um, we use uh, Real Illusion um, to do some some character gen generation. And what the, the the program does is it makes sure the constraints on the bones, like the the sh shoulder rotating cuff, actually performs in the way you'd expect to, rather than just it rotating all the way around behind the back of my head and spinning about and being looking crazy and having my limbs fly everywhere. So that's, that's where you need a program to help you with the bone animation of your rigged mesh. Okay, so you've got to have a skeleton rig in your mesh, and then you've got to have a program that manages that. Oh, okay, it looks like I've, my stream has gone red. Um... Using Unity, making a fighting game, uh, do you have, so you're wanting, you, like, does Unity do it? I I would generally have um, played with other programs rather than Unity. Unity is not necessarily your best one for doing some of that. And you might be able to play with, uh, now I've got to remember the name of it, um, Mixamo. So if you had a look at the Mixamo animations, they've got a bunch of, of already built characters which you can you can reskin and, and change their skins a bit. 
uh, and you can do some uploading, but they sort of come as a as a default character. Why don't you pick one and you get to see Remy. Um, and you can change some bits and you can do some modeling and, and packages. But one of the nice things it does, it comes with some, some animations. Um, some of these might be relevant. Um, does it has any fighting ones? No, it doesn't look like it's got uh, too many specifically fighting ones. It does have 52 pages of animations, so there are a lot of them. Um, so if we do search for punch. So yeah, it's got, got some examples of punching in there. Um, and so you could download some of these animations. That would give you a, a rig that has animations attached to it. And then you could attach those two characters that you'd made and use that to kind of give you some of those animations that you might want for a for a fighting game um just as a as a way to get some animations in um that yeah that's that's one place to go and find a bunch of generic um standard animations that you can use uh, and search for the different kinds of punch you might be able to want you might want for your characters okay so and those you can import those into Unity, and then rather than having Unity edit them, you are just importing them and then choosing between which one to use. So that and Unity can help you do that. Uh, it's not great at actually generating any of this stuff, but it's, it's per perfectly reasonable at, at kind of interpreting it and giving you control over use. Okay, if there's no other questions. I'll say harder to my Norwegians. Harder, but um and uh, good health so have a good weekend and um i'll see you on discord